Hey everyone, today I'm joined by Chicky Chicatelli. He was a bookie for the Mafia. He worked underneath the Genovese crime family. Today we're going to be talking about Chicky's life within the Mafia and his boss, Big Al Bruno. Ultimately, Chicky went to prison for his crimes, and while he was in prison, he met a lot of interesting characters. One that really stood out to me was Vincent Basciano, which was the boss of the Bonanno crime family at one time. Please hit subscribe if you want to get more interviews like this. And without further ado, let's get into Chicky's story. Well, I was, uh, I was convicted of being a, a bookmaker maker out of Western Massachusetts uh, with uh, the Genovese crime family. And that's not like me saying it. I mean, it's public knowledge. And uh, yeah, so that's, a, that's, yeah, uh, yeah, that's public knowledge. Uh, I was convicted and uh, went to federal prison uh, on a, a, a gambling ring with um, the boss and the underboss of our area for the Genovese crime family. Uh, but it ended up just being the underboss because the boss, uh, uh, who was my boss for a lot of years, uh, Adolfo Big Al Bruno actually had got murdered uh, the year before we were indicted. So he would have been on our indictment, but uh, obviously due to the circumstances, he wasn't in on, on our indictment because of that. Right. Okay. Um, how did you join the, you know, Genovese crime family? Um, well, remember I wasn't a, I wasn't a made man. I wasn't, I was an associate. Um, and I joined, you know, just basically uh, growing up in my city, it was a big, big, uh, a big uh, uh, presence of, uh, you know, of organized crime, uh, particularly the Genovese crime family operating out of Western Mass in uh, Connecticut and upstate New York. And uh, we always were around it. I mean, growing up, uh, you know, uh, before, you know, as a young kid, 14, 15, 16 years old, the guys, you would, we, we, I, I had a, a job at a, a fruit stand that uh, um, a friend owned, and his family owned and uh, they would all come in the fruit stand and, uh, you know, they do their business and they'd go up in the back room and uh, they talk and we got to know them. And uh, so we were around them a lot. And then as we got older, you know, we uh, we, you know, we started opening up bars and stuff and they were around us. And uh, some of the bars, we went partners with them. They owned the bar and we ran them for them. So it was just basically being around these guys and uh, they start taking a liking to you and they they see something in you that, you uh, you know, they want, they want to bring you forward and, 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 and it's little, you know, you start off something doing little things and you move your way up. And, uh, that's basically, uh, how I got started. And, uh, like I said, I got started with, a with, a uh, Adolfo, uh, big Al Bruno, who, uh, at the time was a, a soldier and, uh, eventually works his way up to be the boss and, um, took a liking to me. You know, I was, uh, fresh right out of the military. I was in the military, and uh, I got out of the military and I came back home and I didn't know really what I wanted to do. And uh, I just started working for him doing a, a, actually the sports bookmaking office. Uh, and it went from one office to uh, several years later to doing all the offices. You know, I was basically like the head guy for him as far as the sports bookmaking. So, uh, yeah, and it just it, it works its way up from there. And that's that's what I did, you know. Yeah. So what was uh your official title as you know, what you were doing for them? Well, I was actually, uh, uh, I was a, a bookmaker. I was, a, I was, uh, probably one of the biggest bookmakers for him, for sure for him. And, uh, I handled at one time, probably 80 to a hundred guys. And, uh, which, you know, we had a lot of guys that at one time calling me because a lot of the guys that were doing it, uh, took pinches for bookmaking. And then of course, when they were, they couldn't do it no more, their office would get forwarded to me, you know, so I would take on their office and, uh, yeah, for, for quite some time, I was, uh, you know, one of the biggest bookmakers out of Western Massachusetts, uh, for Bruno and, um, yeah, went that way a long time and, uh, took a, took several pinches for bookmaking, no violence, just straight bookmaking. Um, and would, would, would pinches like regular, uh, state pinches like that, not federal, but state pinches like that. It's usually a fine probation, and then, of course, you know, you do good on probation. And then, you know, after a year or two years probation, you don't get in trouble or nothing. It's kind of like essentially never happened. But then uh, we started getting hit with uh, federal federal charges. And then that becomes a whole other ball game. as far as, uh, <coughs> excuse me, as far as, you know, jail time and, and various stuff like that. Um, yeah, I put uh, our first federal case, like I said, uh, in 2005, we picked up a federal case and uh, it ended up resulting in 2007, me going to uh, USP, United Space Penitentiary, Canaan, in Weimar, Pennsylvania, 
um, for my first time um, going to prison, I ended up uh, the first couple months I was at MCC Manhattan in uh, uh, the Southern District in Manhattan, which is a heavy hitter joint. You're talking about mob bosses. You're talking about um, at one time uh, El Chapo Guzman was there. Uh, <clears throat> John Gotti Sr., Sammy the Bull. I mean, not with me, but I'm saying they were all there at one time. All the heavy hitter guys <clears throat> from New York City uh, were, all, were at one time or another at MCC Manhattan. And uh, <clears throat> I just happened to be going through there waiting to go to MCC Manhattan. And uh, there's some serious guys with me in there, real serious guys. And uh, the guys I met were really gentlemen. And uh, there were some heavy hitters that are very known uh, in the prison system today. Yeah, and who were some of those that you were there with? Um, I was on uh, 11 South. That's that's a it's a, it's a floor in MCC Manhattan. I was on 11 South with uh, the allegedly uh, at the time. <coughs> excuse me, I got a little cold. Um, with the acting boss of uh, allegedly the acting boss of the Bonanno family, Vincent Basciano, Vinnie Gorgeous, and uh, also with Alex Rudai. He was the Albanian from the Bronx, and he had a pretty serious crew: Nikki Nails, Lenny. Uh, uh, Angelo Diapetro, really, really a lot of different guys, uh, you know, heavy hitter guys. And I'll tell you the truth, uh, my experience, they were all uh, true gentlemen. Tell me the story about when you met uh, Vinny, the mob boss, out in uh, when you're in jail. Yeah. So me and Vinny were on 11 South in MCC Manhattan. And uh, I was probably there about three days. And I noticed a guy, real nice guy, real gentleman of a guy, dark tan like, you know, perfect hair. Like he just went to the barber shop every day, just a real big smile on his face all the time. And I, it, it, it took me aback. I'm like, my God, I can't imagine, you know, what he's here for. Cause I didn't know who he was at the time. And I'm like, wow, this is the way you got to do time. However, this guy's doing it. Cause he just looked like he was having fun every day and I couldn't believe it. So, uh, you know, a couple of days, two, three days goes by and he's really, you know, laughing with me and he's telling me yeah come eat with me you know he's telling me to eat at his table with him and so a couple guys come up to me and they're like chicky you know some other guys met me and they're like chicky why does Vinny like you so much i said i have no idea the guy's a gentleman and they go do you know who he is and i go no i don't really know him i, I mean i know him from here and he goes well that's the boss and i go the boss of what and they go that's uh, the acting boss in the banano family Vinny basciano Vinny gorgeous and i said wow you know it don't matter i mean well it's great but it don't matter to me the guy's a gentleman so mm -hmm. uh over the course of about a month, we became very close, you know, within the 11 South unit. And uh, the guy was just what a gentleman. Uh, and then another guy, too, I met was Alex Rudai, who uh, was the Albanian from the Bronx. They had him as the sixth family at one time, allegedly as the sixth family. I guess they I think they called him the corporation. That's what they, the media called him. But and he had his whole crew there. They were waiting to go. They had just got found guilty and they were waiting to go do like uh, 38 years or something. And uh they had Nikki. Nikki was a friend of his and Lenny uh, and Angelo Diapetro. And they had a whole crew of Italian and Albanians that got together and they were real. They were a real serious crew. Everybody knows them from New York and they were gentlemen. I mean, uh, I took Alex took to me and we were just, you know, every day you're with somebody and, you know, they know if you're in a good mood, you know, if they're in a bad mood or just, you know, everything about them, you know, how many kids they got when they talk to their kids on the phone, you get close to somebody. And uh, Vinny though, Vinny really took me. Uh, so, about a month goes by and uh, they say, you know, the, the, they make the announcement in the block. Chickatelli, pack it up. And I didn't know anything. I figured at that time I was going that night. But Vinny goes, no, they tell you to pack it up. But you might be two or three days before they take you because they were going to take me to USP Canaan at the time in Weimar, Pennsylvania. So uh, Vinny was right. Two or three days later, they 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 come and get me at five o'clock in the morning and they, they get me and they open the cell. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh <clears throat> Vinny wakes up and I go, Vinny, I just want to say bye. I'm leaving. They're calling me. And he goes, Oh, come on, Chicky, I'll walk you out. You know, he got to walk me out of uh like into the uh into the main uh octagon where like they have the chairs and the TVs and stuff. And he walked me out and Alex happened to be up at the time having coffee and he came over and uh it was funny because I used to joke around with uh <clears throat> excuse me, I used to joke around with Vinny all the time. And uh so we're walking out and I'm right to get I'm right about to get to the they call it a uh uh they're like a hallway where they lock you in and you got to wait there until they come get you. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we got a little cold. So Vinny said, Chicky, um, he goes, 
I wish I knew you on the street. I had a lot of laughs with you. You know, we could have had a lot of fun. He goes, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're a funny guy. You would have made me laugh. And I go, Vinny, not for nothing, you know, because now I knew his case. I go, Vinny, not for nothing, but I'm only here for a small bookmaking beef. You're facing two death penalty cases. I said, you know, <laughs> going away for maybe a life sentence. And I started laughing and I go, not for nothing, but I'm glad I didn't know you on the street. And he started laughing. He goes, get out of here. You know, like just, you know, but he took it good, you know, but uh, <clears throat> a hell of a guy. What a, what a gentleman. It was a pleasure meeting him. Like I said, it was a small, short time, but what a, what an impression he made on me. Both of them, what true gentlemen. Yeah. So, okay. I'm moving on. What was, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what was your relationship with, uh, you know, your boss, you know, like how was it like when you were putting all this work in for him, what were some things that he did for you? Oh, Bruno, Bruno was a great guy. I mean, anybody that knows him will tell you the same thing. I mean, I was at his house every Sunday for dinner. His wife, Anna would cook and he had five sons. And uh, I was closest to Victor. Victor was uh, one of his sons. Uh, he was uh, second to the youngest. You know, he was the second. It was a young one. And then he was the next one. And uh, Victor was close to me. He was in my wedding party when I got married. And uh, Bruno was a good guy. Bruno was a class act. I mean, he was, a, he was an old school gangster, flashy. Uh, <clears throat> if I had to compare to anybody, I would just say from my little area, Western Mass, he was like the John Gotti in my area. You know, the flashy clothes, the cigars, the... You know, everybody liked him, gentlemen, everywhere he went, people liked him. And uh, he liked me, you know, he did. He liked me and he he, he he took good care of me, you know, as far as, you know, watch out. And uh, like I said, I did a lot of, I, I was, you know, like I said, I was only doing sports book making for him. I was doing no violent stuff or nothing like that because there wasn't too much that around. I mean, there is that around, but it wasn't that much around. Today, forget about it. They don't even do that much no more. But uh, <clears throat> Bruno was a good guy. I mean, uh Anybody, like I said, anybody that knew him will tell you he was a gentleman and uh, it is what it is, you know, in that in that business. Uh, it's, it's you never know day to day. You're very vol volatile. It's vo very vol volatile. You don't know what's going to happen. And uh, unfortunately, you know, he paid with his life. And uh, and that was a shame. But, you know, like I said, in that business, it's a shame. But that them things happen. You know, you never expect it. And then next thing you know, you know, you're reading the paper the next day and you see a, a hor horrific thing, you know. Yeah. What ultimately ended up happening to him? What was the situation? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What was the um, situation? Well, you know what? There's 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 several there's several theories, you know. But in the end of the day, um, you know, it, it's it, you can go on social media. I mean, you can go on Google and Google it. I mean, it's just too much to get into. It would take an hour and a half. But um, you know, there was younger guys underneath him, and you know, he wasn't doing the right thing, I guess, according to some people. And then. Other people say that uh, a 302 came out on him, that he was talking to the federal agents, which, I mean, they say it's out there. I mean, I don't believe, I don't believe me personally. I don't believe he ever was an informant. Um, he was a, one thing about Bruno, he was a politician. Uh, <clears throat> you know, if he's seen cops and they came up to him, he would shoot the shit with them. Not, not telling them anything, but he was a, you know, he would be one of them guys that would kind of feel them out like he was feeling, they were feeling him out. You know, he was a politician. He could. He could, you know, be at dinner parties with judges just as just as much as street guys. He was sharp like that. So <clears throat> I think sometimes people thought maybe, you know, he wasn't supposed to be doing that. And that got him in some trouble. That's what I think. But like I said, there's several different theories. But uh, <coughs> November, uh, November 23rd, a Sunday night, approximately 1030 at night. Um, he was at a Sunday night card game. He was coming out of the card game. And uh, unfortunately, um, uh, a lone gunman came up and shot him five times, I believe five times, uh, a couple times in the face, a couple times in the stomach and in the groin. And, uh, you know, he, he, he was dead. I mean, you know, and it was big news. It was very big news. And it was, a just the whole city was up in arms and they couldn't believe it. And a lot of his friends couldn't believe it. And a lot of his, you know, just a lot of people were shocked by it. It was, it was a really, really uh, crazy time, Damn. you know? Yeah. So, <clears throat> That you said that was ultimately some kind of, you know, kind of a war that was going on. <laughs> right. It was like a, a power struggle. And then, like I said, the 302 thing came out and then the power struggle. And it was, I guess, according to the papers, there was an order from New York, which I believe it, it came out in, in court. It's not like I'm giving any information. It came out in court that it was a, <clears throat> you know, it was a order from New York. And, uh, you know, and then just that's the way it happened. It happened. Yeah. So. How did you make it out of the, you know, the mob alive? Well, 
I think what you see on TV and what you hear on the news, it's a lot different than it really is now. Don't get me wrong. I was never a, I was never a made man. I guess you say a made man. I mean, I think uh, things would have went a little different with uh, what happened to people. Um, the younger generation got pinched. Uh, the, you know, the younger guys under Bruno that took over got pinched and some went to jail and some became informants. And uh, it just, it just ripped, it ripped Western mass apart as far as, uh, organized crime it, it 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 pretty much destroyed western mass and organized crime and uh i think if things would have went differently and certain people stayed in power i might have had a shot of going that route but now i look back and say thank god almighty it didn't go that way because uh <clears throat> i was only a associate so an associate pretty much you know I, I ended up going to jail like i said i i was in jail and when i got out of jail in 2008 uh, I went in and when I got out in 2008, I was on a three year probation. So from 2008 to roughly, you know, 2011, I really couldn't go around nobody. And, and it was a blessing in disguise because during that time period is uh, <clears throat> when all the pinches came down for Bruno's murdered. Uh, they, they were they all the guys were pinched probably around 2009, 10, right in there. That was a crucial three years. And just thank God almighty, I was on probation. Because during that time, I couldn't go near nobody. And looking back, like I said, I thank God I couldn't. Because there's a lot of things that were, you know, a lot of different situations that happened. And people got arrested during that time frame where, thank God, you know, if I was around, who knows? Maybe I would have been picked up too. You know, who knows? But looking back, thank God I wasn't. But right. so <clears throat> there's guys today that there's guys that get out, even made guys get out today. You know, they will do a ton of time. They come out. They're never going to say they're officially out. But there's guys that just, you know. They put them. They call it putting it on a shelf, but they put themselves on a shelf. You, you know, sometimes you get in trouble, and you have other guys put you on a shelf where you're like kind of banned from that life. But nowadays, and I mean, this is a whole new era in 2022. But guys are the guys are coming out of jail and putting themselves on a shelf. They don't want to get involved. There's too much heat. I mean, to be a criminal in 2022 or to want to join the mob in 2022, you got to have your head examined with uh, you know, with all the technology by the government and the RICO acts and and the and the informants that I mean, come on. Nowadays, the informants if they if you're an informant, you can come out and have a YouTube channel and uh, you can make a lot of money and be a star. I mean, look at Sam Gravano. <clears throat> you know, he's got hundred half a million people subscribers, making a ton of money. And you know, what's his legacy on life? Killing nineteen people, and then you know, a year later or a couple years later, after he does his time, he gets caught in a big ecstasy ring, and then goes back in for seventeen years. You know, a guy like that's on YouTube making all kinds of money. I mean, it's just, we're in a whole nother world now. It's a crazy world. So for somebody who's in that life or even associate or even a made guy that wants to pull out as a gentleman and come out, do his time and just come out and have nothing to do with it, you know, what's better, a guy like that? Or is it better a guy who comes out and plays the role like he's a somebody and then gets pinched and has to go do 30, 40 years and turns over on everybody he's friends with? So, right. you know what I mean? It's about picking and choosing, you know? Yeah. So you would never recommend this life for no one. No, I mean, you know what I mean? Uh, be honest with you, <clears throat> in the 80s, 90s, I wouldn't even recommend it then, but it was at least it was an honor. It was like, you know, everybody, you were there for each other. You thought in your head, but I'm lucky I never got to that point where I really got so, you know, there's people that get really deceived in that life and it cost them their life and it cost them their family's life. And I just thank God almighty, I never got to that level because uh, it is looking back now, you can see it's just... <clears throat> People that are already in it and they're already been involved for years. It is what it is. They just, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're involved and that's great, but it's just, uh, it's a tough life. It's a tough life, you know, from what I experienced. And I, I only experienced it at a very little level compared to a lot of my friends. I had friends of mine that I grew up with that experienced it, you know, where they were made and they were actually bosses and, uh, you know, it doesn't end good. It either ends in jail it ends in being killed or it ends in becoming an informant. So it doesn't end too good. Not too many guys right off into the sunset, you know, with their family. I mean, they lose their families. You lose your kids. Your kids don't want to talk to you. I mean, I'm just saying, this is what you got to look forward to in that life at the end. You know what I mean? There's not too many people that right off into the sunset, which that's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. Yeah, no, that's true, man. Um, is there any, uh, other crime families that you were, you have any kind of stories with that you were involved with that you? No, no, not real. No, I mean, personally, like I said, out of Western Massachusetts, I mean, it's public knowledge. It's not like I'm giving any secrets, but
but it's always been the Genovese family for probably the last 80 years, you know, 80, 90, 80, 90 years has been the Genovese. I mean, uh, obviously Providence has the Petriarca family, Boston too, um, you know, Connecticut, there's some Genovese and some, uh, and, uh, Obviously, there's some Petriarchas and some Gambinos. I mean, it's all uh, a piece of the pies everywhere, pretty much. You know what I mean? But uh, like I said, no, I really never had no dealings with other. Uh, I mean, of course, I've known people that were in other s- factions, but I've never really had any twinings or anything like that with them. And of course, it's pretty sad to say, but when I went to jail, I met the most people from different crime families and different people. And uh, I never had a bad experience with any of them. I, they were ju- the ones I met were gentlemen and uh like I said about the Vinny Basciano and the Alex Rudeyes. And um, there's another guy, Anthony Magali from Connecticut, Stanford. He was, uh, I guess, a big shot with the Gambinos. Nice guy. I met him at MCC Manhattan. Another guy, really, really nice guy. And it's like I said, from how the how the media portrays him, if you meet him in you know real life and spend any time with him, it's it's really surprising because they are there are a lot of gentlemen that you know if you listen to the media, you think they're animals, you know? Yeah. So did you have any other uh, topics or anything you wanted to talk about? No, just uh, like I said, the only topic I will say is, and I don't badmouth nobody, you know, I just, uh, like I said, the people that are uh, caught up in that business or if they are running around, just know that there are other ways out. You don't have to, you know, and I'm, this is the way I'm, I'm, I tell people, and maybe I'm not an expert. Uh, maybe I know a little more than most people and not enough other people, but you don't have to, you don't have to be in that life and think of yourself as like, nobody thinks of it. You know, if you want to get out, you can get out. Like, in other words, don't don't think a lot of people want to stay in it while they're getting good. And then as soon as they get caught and they got to go do 30, 40, 50 years, 20 years, they become informants. They turn up, testify against their friends. You don't have to do that. I mean, believe me, uh, if if you feel as though like you see the writing on the wall, there's nothing wrong with pulling back and just getting out and, 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 and just, you know, staying free from that. You know, don't wait till you're doing 40, 50 years and then you're going to all of a sudden say, you know what? Uh, you know, let me just testify again, go, you know, join team USA and, uh, you know, you can get out of jail free card. I mean, if anything, I, you know, I, I just, there is another way out. You don't have to do that. So, but anybody in 2022 that's getting involved with any kind of crime has got to have their head examined. And like I said before, with the technology and the RICO laws and everything, the best thing I could say is anybody is a young kid coming out of high school. You don't know what you want to do. Join the military. I was in the Navy. I seen the world as a young kid. And, uh, you know, if I didn't get retired out of the military to do uh, some due to an accident, I probably would have stayed in the military for 20 years. You know, I mean, that's I loved it. I was stationed at Pearl Harbor in Honolulu. It was just great. So any young kid that's coming out of high school and they really don't know what they want to do, look into the military for four years goes by so fast and you can start a hell of a career if you choose to. So that's pretty much the, the you know, don't wait. Don't wait until uh, you're facing 50 years in prison and say you should have changed your life. Do it before then. Well, when everyone thinks, Chicky's got a really interesting story. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this video. Please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy it. And if you're interested in Chicky and what he's got coming in the future, he's definitely going to be a part of a lot of different movies that are coming out. If you want to support me and my clothing brand, I got t-shirts, hoodies, beanies, sweats, all on my website. I'll be sure to put a link in the video description. Chicky's also going to be part of my documentary that I've been working on about the American Mafia. This documentary is actually going to be a documentary series. There's going to be 11 episodes and Chicky's going to be on two of them. Please subscribe to my channel if you want to be the first to get that when it comes out. Thank you again so much for watching and to give you a better understanding about what my documentary is going to be about, please check out this trailer. This life is very twisted. You never know when it's your time to go. One day you're putting in work with someone and the next day they're taking you out. In our days, it was very quiet. You know, nobody ever talked about this. You know, nobody glamorized it. It was all like hush hush. Not a glamorous life. And again, it's not what you see in Goodfellas. It's not what you see in Casino. Some days you were dead broke. Some days you had two grand in your pocket. It wasn't every day. You know, you don't know anything else. You don't know what it is to go wake up six o'clock and go to work. Work? What the fuck is that? I wasn't going to work. Even bosses get murdered in this life. There was younger guys underneath him and he wasn't doing the right thing, I guess. He was coming out of the card game and unfortunately, uh, a lone gunman came up and shot him five times. People knew me to tell you, I like to use the bat a lot. If I had to shoot you, I'd shoot you too. I've done that. This life requires many mixed personalities. You have to wear many hats in this life to try and survive. You become four or five different people all at once. And 
you got to go home and be a dad and a husband. You got to go to work and do your job. You got to be out in the street and be a gangster. The Bonanno family is called the Bonanno family because of my grandfather, Joe Bonanno. That life there is gone. Uh, today you have to be legitimate yeah, today. Man. But you're going to be an idiot to want right. to be a hooligan today. Because Jail time's now like 100 years for doing right. nothing. Yeah, you, you'll be dead in prison for life or in the witness protection program. I don't know anybody. Now, when the mafia turned their back on me, I know everybody. There was the big flip of the Gambino underboss, Sammy the Bull Gravano. Here he is signing autographs in a restaurant on Mulberry Street. It was supposed to be a secret organization. He was a very, very, very violent guy. No question about it. Albert Anastasia, he was a Brooklyn guy. He was probably the biggest killer in the history of the mob. Michael Francis, his father, Sonny, uh, was a really tough guy, but he really raised his son right. Son, if you want to see a gangster, that's Sonny Francis. And John Cena, you don't compliment anybody. This is a documentary series about the American Mafia. It includes 11 different crime families. Each episode is about a different one. The crime families include the Gambino, Genovese, Bonanno, Colombo, Lucchese, the Gallo Crew, Chicago Outfit, the Philadelphia Mafia, the Patriarca, the Traficante Crime Family, and the Jewish Mafia. Please subscribe to my channel to watch each episode as they come out.